Okay, so much for my rant. Now we're going to get into this a little more. And I'm sticking just with Mark now because I want to sort of acquaint you with when you go to do this yourself, what do you look for when you do it? We already covered about you first got to find the variance in the other text. And Bible works, as I showed you, is the best way to do that. Even though you have to squint. Okay. And then you, you basically are copying the text from, in this case, Bible works. And then you find what the variants are and you stick them in. That's a long process. It took me probably five hours to find out what the variants were and then stick them in here. Okay. Because it's, it's not easy. But it was a heck of a lot harder for the people who came up with the material so that you could even find out what it is. I can't stress this enough. For 2,000 years, ever since Christ was here, Bible has never, ever been more available than it is now. You cannot imagine people went their whole lives and they didn't know what's right in front of your screen. In any language. They didn't see it. They heard about it from somebody who claimed to have seen it. That's like somebody who claims he met Paul McCartney. Saw Paul McCartney on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Which I actually did. You know, like 40 years ago. Okay, but you're taking my word for it. You wouldn't know Paul McCartney if he walked in front of you. Okay, because he didn't look today what he looked like 40 years ago. All right? You're taking my word that I'm telling you that that happened. So you never saw the actual original yourself. That's the problem here. And that's what this whole prophecy, Mark covering what's going to end up being 1,281 years of it, which is kind of cute why it comes up with 1,281. We saw that, that Matthew is covering 3,220 years. That Luke was covering 1,085 years. So why is Mark doing 1281? Okay, because I put notes here now. Why is Mark doing 1281? See? Well, preview of coming attractions. He takes all of the dateline meters in the other books that are, came before him. He adds them together. And that decided how long he was going to carry history out to. But he adds to it. He's, he's updating the prophecy that the Lord gave. Because this is written, you know, by men. But it's inspired by God. Remember, see, it says so right here. Right here. The Holy Spirit is speaking through you. You don't worry what you're going to say. I never do. I should probably, but I don't. I just, I just talk extemp right now. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth next. If it's right, it's because the Holy Spirit did it. Well, it's like writing scripture is similar. But you have to know scripture much better. And that's what happened is God first trains the writers in understanding Him so well and so fluently, they, fluently that they can just write this out. And that's what happened here in Mark 13. And fluently and cleverly, he decides, oh, okay, I'm going to take all the New Testament books that went before me. I'm going to add them up as, as far as what dates they were written. Okay, because like this one, 63 years before the millennium is when Christ talks. Mark is writing 24 years before the millennium. He's also writing 91 years after Herod started his rebuilding and what I was going to cover now. He's also writing 119 years after Caesar crossed Rubicon. Those are date lines. And every Bible writer uses them. At least two. Usually two. Sometimes more. Like Mark is using more here. And then he takes all those date lines of the writers that went before him in the New Testament, he adds them up, and that's where he's getting it. This is a very clever way of saying, Hi, I'm proving to you that God is enabling me to write, because first of all, I got all that other information in my, set, my head, and how can I know it so fluently that I could just write it out like this, if it didn't come from God. This is a way of proving that it's coming from God, not just the human writer. And the clever thing here, unlike most of the writers, he's using a third dateline. 
And again, when you see these orange, when the first time the text sevens, it's an official dateline. The theme of the for dateline formula tells you what the text is going to be about. Makes it easier to remember. So 63 is the first dateline, 91 is the second dateline, and 119 is the third. They're all official. They're all related to the text. Whereas this, which is also a dateline, but it's unofficial because it's not seven. Mark is saying, hi, I'm Mark. I'm writing you 24 years before the millennium starts. Okay? And what's so clever about this, and I wanted to really stress it, is Mark is th the same 69 AD. is 63 years after Judea becomes a province. is 91... 63 years, rather, after Judea became a province, which it became a province in 6 AD. So 63 and 6 is 69 AD. It's not hard to know when these people write. And then I'm writing you also 91 years after Herod started rebuilding. And I'm also writing you 119 years, and they're all, they all mean 69 AD. 69 minus 91, Herod was rebuilding. 69 minus 119 is when Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Now, people of Mark's time, of Jesus' day, they didn't have TV, they didn't have computers, they didn't have distractions. So what they did is they played with their own history and their own culture as a way to be entertained. Everybody knew, centuries later, when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, but they didn't understand it in terms of, you know, 49 B.C. like we do. They knew it as years from today. Years prior from today. Everybody kept chronologies like that. So everybody, when Mark wrote, and they saw 119, they would immediately know, because it's always a famous formula date that that's coming from Caesar across the Rubicon. And the reason they know is because of the text. First it says, not one stone will be upon another. And then it's saying, as Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, and everybody knows this. So why does Mark go into detail? The Mount of Olives is opposite the temple. Why is he saying that? Everybody knows that. Well, he'd only need to be saying it if it wasn't going to last. And it's not going to last if Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. And it's not going to last because the armies Jerusalem is surrounded by, one of them is in a bid to become emperor. And all the emperors are fighting all over the Roman world because each one is claiming to be emperor. And then one wipes out the rest and it's the last man standing. And that's going to end up being Titus. I mean, Vespasian. Okay, so the guy who's surrounding Jerusalem at the time Mark writes is going to end up being the emperor due to a civil war that's going on when he writes. And that's why he makes parallel to Caesar crossing the Rubicon because that was the last time Rome suffered a civil war since the current one. And it was Caesar crossing the Rubicon, which is a, a river outside, just outside of Gaul just before you come to Italy where Rome was because he did that he went against custom and everybody said oh boy he's coming to he's coming to become dictator of Rome that's what they were afraid of he's crossing with an army and you were never supposed to do that okay well the same armies are around Jerusalem now so it's a good parallelism it's exactly what's going on as he writes so you see, all these meters have meaning, and they relate to the text. And then, like here, when he's doing 217, that has, a, that has a meaning to other Bible texts. But the first thing you're supposed to get out of this, okay, 217, the meaning in other Bible texts has to do with Daniel 9, 24 to 27, minus the 14 years that, uh, that you know, um, Israel screwed up on. So what's that got to relate to this text? Well, everybody's going to come and try to fool you, mislead you. 
Okay, see? Saying that I am Christ in order to mislead you. Oh, yeah, well, that's why Mary's text was talking about Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It's all about being misled by the Antichrist. Yep, it's going to be a whole lot of Antichrist. And what you need to know is Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. It means instead of fake Christ, false Christ, pretending to speak for God. Sound familiar? So 217 has a doctrinal meaning because of the way it was used in the Bible before. So in effect, it's like cross-referencing Mary and Daniel 9, 24 through 27 at the same time simply by using 217. But it even has a bigger meaning than that. Because this is saying 217 years from when Christ said this, this very thing is going to be happening. People are going to be pretending to be him. Yep, they were. This was the rise of Irenaeus. This was the rise of Tertullian. This was the rise of Origen. And this particular thing is 247, so it's after they rose, they published their junk, and everybody decided they were spiritual giants when instead they were spiritual morons. But they pretended to speak for Christ, and they used nice, holy, flowery words. So nobody bothered to actually examine what they said. To realize it was junk. So you see, it's prophetical of a specific time in the future, and that's the doctrinal meaning of Daniel 9 24 through 26. As your backstory to hi, people are going to be saying that I, I'm the Christ. See, if you're speaking for God, you're speaking as his emissary, you're speaking as somebody who's supposed to be authoritative. Okay, but are you saying the truth about him? We all got that job, okay, to a lesser extent or a greater extent. But when somebody sets himself up as the vicar of Christ, a bishop, and then spews the most garbage junk that is even worse than any lie Donald Trump ever told, then you need to be aware that's going to happen and it's all predicted right here especially happening between 230 AD and 247 AD which is when those guys I just mentioned rose okay and wrote their stupid stupid letters and writings and treatises and all their garbage which everybody praises because they don't actually read what the guys wrote so that's 15 false Prophet, P R O F I T here, and then 16, okay, being used to also signify the same thing, you know, go astray, 16, double eight, okay, I'm trying to make you go completely astray, 4444, four, four, four. It's, it's got a lot of meaning, it's got a lot of ha ha meanings in the number, okay, versus. When you hear of wars, don't get upset. Ah, well, if you don't get upset, then you're growing spiritually. That's going to happen, too, right alongside from 247 A.D. to 268 A.D. And scholars actually call that period the crisis of the 3rd century. So you see how apt Matthew, I mean Mark here, is playing it. He's keying the syllables to the future years when these, this text is going to be really relevant to know. Now, Matthew had done that. Luke had done that. Paul had done that. Peter had done that. And after Peter died, Jude had done that. But they used very different words. Okay? So for Mark... To be able to be so accurate. Because you can just check this in history. Okay. Just go look up church fathers if you want to verify this. Okay. You want to verify this? Go look up crisis of the third century. It ends with Chorus. 268 AD. As, yeah, Chorus. 268 AD was his first uh, uh, year in power. 267 was the end of Gallienus. 
Okay, that's how accurate this is. Only this guy is writing you in 69 AD. Okay, so then you know this text came from God because it's benchmarked as to what year it belongs to. And the words that go with it are not the same. Not, this is really important, not the same as what Matthew said. Not the same as what Luke said. Not the same as what Paul said. Not the same as what Peter said. They're all related though. And if you were to fit for each segment of time, because we got the meters for them all, you were to fit everything everybody said. It'd be like a four-part song or a puzzle. And you put all the pieces together and you have a pretty good intel on what happens during these segments of history. Okay? They're all stressing something slightly different from somebody else. And once you know what that history is, it's like, oh wow, they really foretold it. This is really the word of God I'm looking at here. And the proof is in the meter. Not only the proof as to whether or not the writer used these syllables and actually wrote them down in the right place. But what time period supply? And what text to that time period belongs? And each one has his own slant on it. And when you add them up together, it's like, and you go look at the history. That's why it's real important to go do this. Go take this, look up the years, add, always add 30. Look up the years to know what happened. Okay? Just look them up. This one's slightly different because he's, he's pointing years to the future. I'm writing you in 69 AD and 24 years are left to when the millennium was supposed to start. Had there been no church, which should have been 94 AD, but of course it didn't happen that way. Okay? Christ is talking 63 years after Augustus came to power. He's talking 63 years before the millennium was supposed to start at the end of the year in which he talks. See, that's why these datelines are really important. Okay, but other than that, it's like, okay, 119 plus 30 is 149 A.D. Here's the text that applies from the period of 91 plus 30 to 119 plus 30. Let's go look in history and see how true this text is. And it will be, it will be very subtle, like a good play. It'll be satirical. And it will be astonishing. Okay, good plays will focus on little things. Like Aristophanes, the frogs. The whole play is titled The Frogs. But the frogs are only in a small part of the actual play. But they're the movers and shakers of it. If Given their action that takes place over maybe, I don't know, a couple of hours. Alright. The whole action of the play which affects past, present, and future, occurs. It's that kind of thing, say like, Tuyeru. Something about the temple is really important between 91 plus 30 and 119 plus 30. Well, what that was that? Okay, you can go to Wikipedia, you can go to Jewish Encyclopedia, and say, okay, what about the temple during those years? Of course, the temple's down, so the temple area, what happened? Because Tuyeru is the subject, the temple. You see, and then you just go on like this. And then like one other thing is like, oh, you're going to be given over to the authorities. And the time period for that runs from 297 plus 30 to 318 plus 30. And it's like, oh, well, what's that? Yeah, guess again. It's Constantine. Constantine and his kids did more persecuting of Christians than anybody before or since. And by 370, all those kids are dead. Okay? Meanwhile, this is the activity. This is the guy that everybody should not praise. Constantine. Big jerk. Big, evil, disgusting jerk. And he rises to power during this time. Actually, see, that's that's 310. 
He was busy telling everybody Apollo gave him a sign of victory and then two years later he changes it from Apollo to Jesus in order to win you over. So did he believe in Christ? Ah, uh, not exactly. Maybe by the time he died. There will be famines and all kinds of disturbances but they're only the beginning of the birth plagues. Yeah, and this is the time when this guy's evil is getting birthed. Alright, so you see, this is really satirical and very meaningful. So, that was what I was going to say next. And I probably rambled too much, too. Again, notice that there are parallelisms. So, when you see a meter that's similar in number, compare the text. Okay? Because it's meant that you do that. They, they, the, the wording is in a specific syllable count and a specific order so that it results in these kinds of things where you have two 15s and a 16 here and another 16 there and the writers actually benchmarking and indexing and cataloging the text for you by means of doing this okay I think I've talked enough I'm getting tired now and you probably are too peace out